Hello, um, my name is Amanda Knowles and I'm the director of the North Seattle College Art Gallery. I'm also faculty at North Seattle College and um, I'm here today with Morella Zacarias um, and uh, to hear about her work. Um, I want us to get started first. Um, although we're in this virtual space, I do want to actually do the proposed land acknowledgement um, because because we should, especially in these times. So I will read that. Um, On behalf of North Seattle College, we acknowledge that we occupy the traditional ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Duwamish tribe, a people that are still here, continuing to honor and bring to light their ancient heritage. Without them, we would not have access to this gathering, dialogue, and learning space. We ask that we take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to do a really, really short introduction because Amarela is going to do a really good job of introducing herself and, and talking about herself. Um, I'm going to go to a different view. Um, but um, I'll just briefly tell you a little bit about her. Um, uh, she was born in Mexico City, um, lives between uh, Brooklyn and Mexico at the moment, um, and is currently in, in Mexico. So um, um, is, is in, staying in place in, in Mexico. Um, she got a, B, a BA um, from Kenyan in political science and Sinat and what? <laughs> It was it was a synoptic major um, between political science, art, and religion. It was called social movements through art and religion. Oh, beautiful, beautiful! Um, also has an MFA from Hunter College in New York. Um, she was a mural artist for ten years. Um, has three uh, Art Twenty One New York close up videos to her name, she, <laughs> which is amazing. Um, if you haven't seen them, they're just quite lovely to watch. Um, she has had many, many um, exhibitions, both uh, here in the U.S., but also internationally. Um, she's in a hundred private collections in the U.S., uh, Mexico, over a hundred, uh, London and Spain, um, and has some specific site-specific commissions. Um, I know that she's going to talk a lot about one that she's about to install in um, Seattle. Um, uh, and then there are a lot of other ones, um, art and embassies for the U.S. State Department in um, Monterey, Mexico. Um, the, the one thing I do want to say about Marella is that I uh, was able to meet her um, when she was here. Uh, I knew several people who were working for her for the, um, uh, to, to, to get together this, this installation. And uh, she's such a lovely who, um, you know, invited people invited people in. She, she knows how to give a good party. She knows how to like interact with people. And so I, I really appreciated uh, meeting her and, and knowing her through her time in Seattle. So without further ado, I am so happy to introduce you to Marilla Zacharias. Thank you, Amanda, so much for inviting me. I initially, this was going to be a meeting in person. We had planned for me to be there and to be able to meet you and and maybe see some of your work. And I would have loved that. And I'm so glad that you followed up and that we made this happen uh, virtually. Uh, thank you so much for being here today to, to connect with me. I was telling Amanda earlier that it feels really strange that, you know, I spent almost two years in Seattle working on this project. So I, you know, I was, I, I live in Brooklyn and Mexico City, but I spent most of my time in Seattle for the past two years working on this project with a team of 13 people and getting to know the community and the history. And I've been very grateful to your community for, for how they received my work and for how much I've learned from meeting everyone there and for the kind of work I got to do. So it's really nice for me to feel close to all of you today. Um, I was telling Amanda that I was in Mexico. I like finished the project in Seattle and came to Mexico to work on, an, on a show here for Mex in Mexico City. 
and then the pandemic started and then we made the decision to stay here throughout and uh and as much as it is really nice to be in mexico with my family i feel far away from my friends the people i care about the cities that have given so much to me in my life um, especially brooklyn and new york and seattle and so it is very important i know that today is a special day and we're mourning and we are struggling and we are you know finding solidarity and and um a lot of us like blanked our instagrams because because of what's happening today but we are connecting and to me that means a lot because i you know without without each other you know we cannot move forward so thank you for for connecting with me today i think i know it's a special moment for you to be here with me so thank you um and um i guess i'll start with um with how i just quickly i'll give you a rundown of how i ended up here i grew up in mexico city and when i was in high school there was like a big rebellion in mexico that really changed the way that we looked at life and um i think that what's happening today will be with us forever and for all of you who are in college and high school for all of us who are doing whatever i think i think what is happening now will really be something that we will carry forever and will pass on so um i was 16 when i moved 17 when i moved to the the states to go to college in kenyan i went from mexico city to ohio out of all places and you know i was the only mexican woman in this college and didn't know better so i you know i really loved my experience there i started social movements through art and religion because i was coming from a city that was like in the middle of a rebellion of indigenous people and so i wanted to be close to that even though i was far away and that really built my life like the next 10 years after college i was painting murals political murals outside in different communities in guatemala and then eventually i decided to move to new york and do my masters my mfa at hunter and that's where i discovered this new work that i'm going to show you because now I know how to um, share screens. <laughs> so let me share my screen here. Oh, oop. Can, are you seeing the screen now? Yeah, view, full, full screen. <clears throat> um, so remember for 10 years I, were, I was painting two-dimensional work, uh, figurative work, mostly with uh, mostly political, definitely social, uh, with social content. And um, I was trying, like, I, I grew up like knowing the murals of Diego Rivera, Siqueiros, Orozco. If you don't know them, they're like the muralists from Mexico who painted murals after the revolution in Mexico and were trying to really recreate the Mexican identity. and. And that was where I came from, you know, painting for the public. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that happened is that when I was doing these murals in, in different areas and with different groups, I started to kind of like water down my content for the public. And I, and, and I think that you always as an artist have to deal with this, you know, how much can you say and when and how so that it's received in the way, in a powerful way. And when I moved to New York, I kind of, really allowed my intuition to take over and and I found these new materials. I did not know that I was a sculptor at all. I thought I was a painter. And then once I was there and I started uh, experimenting, I realized that I was really feeling these, these materials. And I think I think um, since since that moment, I've really tried my for my intuition to lead the way. I think that uh, is really important to uh, put a lot of information into your brain and do a lot of research and be like, you know, uh, and, and get a lot of material, but then let it go out intuitively because the material and your intuition, in my experience, is always wiser. It always has a better way to say things than, than I do, like consciously. And so the work that I started developing was these three dimensional sculptures. They're made out of wood. And then I make the shape out of window screen and then afterwards I paint it. The painting on it is a lot of my work, even though what you see is sort of is this organic um, kind of abstract paintings, it's always relating to a story. I always try to find a story 
behind the work that will lead that will lead and create the work and and this that you see right here is called uh, the Re Coatlicue's Return. It's a show that I did in Detroit, and I did a lot of traveling in Detroit uh, for you know for a couple months and got to meet a lot of the community there. And I brought a lot of uh, objects from Detroit to my studio in New York. I'm gonna set up a timer so I don't talk too much. Um, and I brought all these materials to my studio, and I started. Um, and the, the, the whole work is about connecting to the city and to what happened there, the industrialization that was there, and then, and then the decay of it. You know, a lot of what's going on now in New York and that we're seeing the burning of buildings, the violence happened in Detroit too, because there was a, an industry of the auto industry that was a lot of money. And then, and then uh, things started to close down and people moved out of the city and it was desolated and a lot of, again like disparity between uh between the rich and the poor and and now detroit is going through a rebirth periods especially when i was there like the artists are rebuilding and so the show is about this story and all the different materials that you see are built on some of the um like this is a tire that i picked up from the street in detroit brought it and washed it and cleaned it and then i made this figure on top of it that is like wrapping it. I feel like my work, um, there's definitely like a healing element. If it's not, if it maybe it's not transmuted to the viewer, it's definitely for me, a healing moment when I'm making the sculptures, when you are like sanding them and building them and then painting them, there's a lot of love and time and care involved in them. Even though they're made on cheap materials, like you can find my materials at the hardware store you know they're not like they're not fancy like it's a tire that is like you know holding this 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 uh, mesh and so I, I think that 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 element is in all of them and then the painting on them is always relating to uh something that is site specific or specific to the story i'm trying to tell these two pieces are two windows from um from a church, abandoned church in Detroit that I then mirrorized and made this, this these uh, um, sculptures on top of them. And they relate to Diego Rivera's murals in the Detroit Institute of Art. Those murals are incredible. They're like a church for me there. Uh, they really are some of his best work. And then the, the title of the piece, and I'm gonna talk about this goddess because when I talk about the project that I'm making for Seattle, um, Chachitlicue is another goddess, Aztec goddess that I've been working with. And uh, Cuatlicue here, you can see it on the, on the left, is the goddess of death and uh, birth, rebirth and destruction of the Aztecs. And the story goes, you know, she's, she's the goddess of the, of the babies that are born, but also of death. And, and in the story, the Aztecs are a little gory sometimes, and they dismembered her uh, and every part of her body became all the different gods of the Aztec universe. So her head became the moon and her arm, you know, all of, all of the different parts of her became different gods. And, and Diego Rivera, the image in the middle is, is a painted Cuatlicue in her, in his mural at the Detroit Institute of Art. And his mural is about the auto industry. And he painted her here disguised as a machine to give, to kind of praise um, technology in the future that it could bring us, but also as a warning about what could happen if things went wrong with, with technology. And I think it's an important reminder of where we are today with, you know, now that we're on Zoom and Facebook and Instagram and we're connecting and it's so important because it levels the ground and we can connect with each other all over the world. Like, then there's also like, what about, you know, we're being watched, we're being recorded, we're being like, uh, so there's there's always that you know in terms of the future of technology is it good is it bad what's going to happen and also these like rebirth uh, and destruction of society as we know it you know I feel like right now we're going through the decay of something but there's always it's important to remember that death always brings birth again you know and so we have to concentrate on that future and that's what Diego Rivera was spending this mural about he was saying we're all part of this today and we are here and we are participants in the future that we create 
and we have to remember these things um, so that the future that we create is better. And, and I think that really speaks about what's going on today. So on the right, you can see my sculpture, which is my, my uh, representation of Coatlicue here. She's in white and here she's painted. And one thing about her is that the structure is made out of uh, crates, mill crates that I picked up again in, in, in Detroit. And it's made out of nine pieces that separate and then they come together. So when it's together, it's like this, and then you can separate the parts and their individual sculptures on their own. So again, like when you see my work, maybe it looks like it's just, um, and, and that's fine for me because you can feel the work and you can see it and you can see the color. But there's always these stories that I'm trying to connect the work to in kind of like a meditation, you know, to give it, um, to give it life and to find the life in the work. Um, so this is just uh, the show. Um, and I'm going to go through the next ones a little quick, quickly, but just wanted to show you. Um, so this is the first piece I did in New York. And, and these also, because you guys are in, you know, studying art and, I moved to New York, I was painting figuratively, and then I'm here and doing my MFA. And a friend who was a curator and introduced me and they said like, oh, we're doing this show and it's Harlem. And they looked at my work and they looked at this thing that I was just beginning to start working with, like this sculpture. And they're like, what about, could you make it? Could you take over this wall? And I was like, sure, like, I don't know how, but yes, you know? And so I did this piece on the wall. It's a, it's a uh, cinder block. I had to do it with like a hammer drill. I got really strong that summer. I made it onto the wall. I sanded it on the wall. There were all these other artists who are really well known, like Olek is right next to me and David Antonio Cruz and Lina Puerta. There's all these really great artists. And here I am standing. We had to cover everyone's work with plastic and, I just moved to New York and I'm doing this, but like, there's something about going for it. You know, like I did not sleep for two weeks. I was on the ground. They gave me $500 for the materials and, and, um, and you know, that has led to so much in my life that it had, if I had not said yes, you know, nothing that I've done now would have happened. And so when those women come, I always like to say, go for it. Even if you don't know what you're doing, like, just give it all, you know? And now I know how to make my work in pieces and now it's in, you know, I'm doing all kinds of things, but this was the beginning. So um, it's a special moment. And then, um, so this was in my MFA show and it was a show about me going back to my father's town in the north of Mexico and like finding my childhood and dealing with violence. But again, it's like, it's my little, I, my little guy on the tricycle, you know, and people can connect it with it in many different ways. Uh, my story is in there embedded in the work, but you know, there's, there's the two views and I could be here for five hours if I tell you all the stories so I'm going to go through and just like show you some of the works. This one is also, I think, pertinent to the moment. This was a show I had at the Brooklyn Museum. And um, they asked me to relate to some of the collection, something in their collection. And Eugenie Tsai, who's the uh, curator of contemporary art, gave me a tour of the whole museum. I mean, I had her, it was such a special moment. And I immediately wanted to connect with the Williamsburg murals. The Williamsburg murals were painted in public housing during the Great Depression in New York. And they were painted by four American abstract artists at a time when abstraction was not popular. It was all about um, figurative art and they were doing this work and they were painted there in public housing for the people to see, even though people did not like or wanted abstract art. But it was, um, this program was encouraged by the WPA where, where the, the government said artists are essential. And we are going to pay artists during this economic depression to make art for the public, for the poor, for the workers. And, and I think this is like, you know, again, an important reminder of what, what the government can do and should do to support all of us in these times. You know, it's not that we're just making work. Uh, I mean, it is, you know, we are contributing to society, to history 
and to the future. And so I made these works and, and, and the work was about the resilience of these objects because they were painted to that time, but they also were forgotten, painted over. And in the 90s, someone found them again and fixed them. And then they're now on display at the Brooklyn Museum. So it was about the resilience of the spirit that times the artist, you know, and abstraction. And so there's four pieces in this in this show, and um, they're actually featured in one of the the R21 episodes. But I think it's it's an important reminder of what we're going through today. Um, this work is also one of the public pieces that I made. Uh, this one is for the the American consulate in um, in Monterey, Mexico, and. It's, um, again, like, when they ask me, I'm from Mexico, I'm Mexican, I went to college in the States, I, you know, was able to stay and work, and then I got married, and then I became a citizen, so I have been one of the lucky people who are able to go through the pathway of citizenship in a seamless, you know, kind of like, not seamless, I cannot call it seamless, but in, there's a, there was a path for me to become a citizen of the US and a lot of people, a lot of workers, most people don't have those options. And going through, even for me, going through this path was not easy. It's expensive. You know, I had to wait for four hours outside of immigration during the winter and they wouldn't let you go pee inside. I mean, they, they made it as hard as possible to go through this process for someone who had all the opportunity to do it. And so for me to do it, a piece in this place, which is the immigration center, like the new consulate was like, it was, there was a lot of, um, on one hand, I am so grateful for my life and for being able to be a muralist and for being, I cannot imagine, like, you know, I've been very, very lucky, very, very, I'm very grateful. And so I made this piece about, um, Mayan textiles and did all this research about how women in that culture have been able to pass on their history and all their theology through these abstract painting, uh, abstract textiles that they make in their clothing. And if you think about it, the Mayans and all the indigenous population in Mexico was colonized by the Spaniards and then they've, you know, we've gone through a lot of like modernity and a lot of, there's a lot of racism against indigenous communities and there's been a lot of, and yet, the Mayan women have been able to keep their histories and to keep their, their culture alive in these textiles because they teach it from woman to daughter and they, they've been passing it generation to generation, but also because it's abstract painting and because it's colorful. So the Spaniards would be like, oh, it's okay. It's just like pretty clothing, you know? And they were able to survive, to make it survive. So it teaches you a lot about the kind of medium that you choose in your artwork because, you know, and then and, and the power of abstraction and the power of this language and the power of this woman. And, and so I wanted to put, so, so these, these painting, these pieces inspired by their work and their symbols that are still alive today. Marilla, uh, can I ask you a question from um, the, I'm looking at the chat and just seeing questions about how big is this, this piece? This piece is uh, 58 feet long ah. by like 11 feet high. And just, a, just to give you an idea, the pieces that I'm doing for the SeaTac airport are 50 feet long by about the same, but on both sides on top and bottom, and it's five of them. So it's like this, what you see here, like times five and bigger. It, it's like an incredible, it's like, yeah, they're huge. And this, so these, um, these are, these are 10, 10 different, um, 10, 20, 20 different pieces that fit into each other like a puzzle on the wall. And they were shipped from my studio in Brooklyn to, uh, they were uh, on a plane, they went to Mexico City and then in a trailer truck to Monterey. And then we met the piece there and installed it. And this is also in another R21 episode. So you can see how it was made and how we hung it and everything that I just said right now, so. And there's a beautiful little clip from your dad, a quote from your dad within that. So I, I urge you all to watch that, just about bringing life into this place where it's uh, everything needs to be by the books. 
Right. You're like, feel so tense when you're there. You have your documents, like, you know, like, and then, yeah. So it was about bringing a little bit light to that. Um, um, one more question and then, and then I'll let it be for a minute. But, um, uh, uh, Karina Garcia asks, uh, I was wondering if you, if you think that Diego Rivera's influence as visual reference is present in your color choices as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, well, Diego, Diego Rivera's murals are a little bit subdued than this because he was using frescoes. So it's like more, look more like a watercolor. Um, I think the colors in Mexico are definitely present in me. My mom was an anthropologist. I traveled with her a lot when I was a child. I'm very interested in textiles, the colors around me, you know. Um, but Diego Rivera obviously definitely had a huge influence. I did many studies on him when I was in college. Uh, I know, you know, everything about him and his work. I was very inspired by how he was like, rebuilding the Mexican identity and he was bringing forward the indigenous kind of like what's going on right now in terms of artists, black artists uh, trying to recreate like put their figures out there and like there's been a resurgence of figurative art in in most of my um, peers like I feel like that was going on in Mexico then after the revolution and Diego and all of them and Orozco and all the painters and they were trying to bring out the figure of the indigenous people and their culture so that we would know who we were and where we came from and giving it an important place in society which do, do not have and so that I feel like more that's more of a, an influence on me but also a big influence on me is the size like I because I was a muralist and because that was my inspiration I've always been attracted to big you know like my scale has always projected big and and I have never been like afraid of taking over these spaces intuitively it's not like I've made it like it just, I just see it and, and I think that comes from Mexican muralism and from wanting to bring work to public spaces so that people will see it who are not necessarily in a gallery or in you know in a private place I like those too but but my, what really fills me up with fire is like making pieces that are for many people. Um, yeah, this is and one thing is like, we look at ruins and like Mexican ruins and, and we see them and they're beautiful and they're like just rock. But I think the more research it's done, there used to be really bright colors on them, you know? And so I feel like connected to that definitely in terms of the public space and bringing color out this piece quickly it's in williamsburg uh new york it's in in this lobby of this hotel it's 25 feet by 25 feet it, it's inspired by brooklyn and it's a map of brooklyn like the outside of it it's a map of brooklyn that it's kind of climbing the wall and it goes two feet and and i did a lot of research about the lenape the indigenous culture that lived there in manhattan and brooklyn before um, they were again colonized and, and sent to Canada actually. Um, but so it's like reclaiming space and it has the, the outline of the city and sort of, you know, claiming the energy that used to be there before Brooklyn became what it is now. It's an interesting because I'm always asked to be, make these works in these spaces that have some, such an important or like historical connotation. And then it's like, how do I bring something different? How do I bring a story from the past into this present to create a new future? And that's kind of like what I try to do with this work so that we don't forget what was there before and we build a better outlook for where we want to go within the structures. And now here is Chao Chitlique. Uh, Chao Chitlique is, Chao Chitlique, um, let me just ask um, Amanda one thing because I can go on. So it's 45 minutes for me to talk and then 15 minutes to questions or 30 minutes and 15. Well, I mean, if we're asking questions along the way, you know, you can just keep going and we can just keep asking you questions. Okay, I just don't want to go. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can really talk too much. Uh, but this is this is really um, I'm very happy to be able to share this with you because you are all there and 
And so I was um, asked to do, to submit a, a work for this commission in Seattle. I was nominated by uh, one of the curators in, in a museum in Seattle. And I, um, and I was like very, very honored to get this commission. It was like 40 artists were asked to submit. And then there was six finalists. And then we were interviewed and then I got this commission. Um, and Chalchitlique, it's to make five sculptures that are on top of the baggage carousels and the new international arrivals at the SeaTac airport. And to me, it was such an honor to create work um, in a place where you're receiving people from all over the world. I mean, think about like all Asia. I mean, there's just so many different people that will go through here on a regular basis. I mean, hopefully, I don't know what will happen now with what things are going on, but I know that that just to welcome people into the US and into Seattle was a huge commitment, a huge responsibility and a huge honor. And so I wanted to do something that would be worthy of, of, of you know, the trust that was being put on, on, on given to me. And, um, and so I when, I, when they asked me to do this, I, I was thinking about Continuum and I was thinking about the horizon and the mountains because there are five sculptures that are like in front of each other, giving you a perspective of, of, yeah, of the horizon. And I thought of mountain ranges, I thought about water, I thought about how to um, create movement in the space. And, and, and once I started going on that route, I decided that the works would be about, would be inspired by water. And then once I started going on that, I started studying the history of water around Seattle and Washington State. And, um, and it's a very powerful story. You know, I think uh, water, we're obviously all made out of water and it's something that connects us all. I was thinking about what kind of element I could work with that everyone who comes through there, regardless of where they're from and and what they do in life and what they believe in, like we all are connected by this element. And, and then, you know, I, I wanted to, I knew that I wanted to give an offering to these bodies of water that I, you know, that I've learned about. And, and so the, the project is dedicated to the bodies of water in Seattle. Um, Chalchitlique, the name, the title of the project, Chalchitlique is another Aztec goddess, very powerful. She's the goddess of water as it collects on earth. So she's the goddess of oceans and rivers and lakes. And to me, it was an offering from the south to the, to the north. I knew that I wanted to learn as much as possible about the history of Seattle and the history of its bodies of water. And, and, and to learn about how they've been transformed, like the Duwamish River and what used to happen there and, and the Puget Sound and all the different villages that used to use it to transport and live around there. And, then, and now to everyone who lives there and it's still really important. And we still are very connected to this water and, and to its history. So I wanted to honor, honor those lands, just like Amanda did earlier, like, to connect to what was there before. Um, these obviously are not painted here, they're just a rendering, but um, this is Chalchitlique, and you can see her, she's also known as the goddess with the skirt of jade, the jade skirt, and this is a river next to her. Um, she, she's also um, very related to birth, because of, of water and she's very powerful. She was in charge of the fourth world of the Aztec mythology and destroyed it. And then we live in the fifth world now. And so it's, it's an important goddess and really, really, um, really powerful force. Uh, but before that, so this is how the sculptures are made. You can see this is the structure made out of wood. Um, each sculpture is made, let me see if I can go forward. Can I um, ask a couple questions first before that? Is that cool? Sure, sure. Okay, um, 
There are a bunch of questions which I will get to, but this one seemed like it made my, a lot of sense. Um, there are two of them. When you work in public art, have you encountered any difficulties in terms of working with public art committees that have an, a different opinion or want to control your, your artistic choice in the work? And if yes, can you elaborate on how you resolved those conflicts? Yeah, I mean, I think that happened, that happened a lot more when I was painting public murals and because you are putting symbols on this because if they're figurative, then you're like putting symbols of the struggle or you're putting, you know, if there's people, you can see the, you know, you're different, putting different races or you're putting like, and everybody has an opinion. And that was kind of one of the reasons why I moved away from that because there were too many people having opinions who were not necessarily artists, right? Like, or not even people in the community, but you had administrators like telling you, well, then you should put two people holding hands, you know? And it's like, that's not the symbol. That's not what I want to do. And, and you had to navigate that. And a lot of times I came out feeling like deflated and not inspired, even though it was, I, I've always been inspired by the community uh, painting in public has always been rewarding and in teams it's always been rewarding that was never a problem but the problem did come when people started to say you can't put that there and the committee says that that's not a good image you know or that or that you have to remove that symbol or that etc and and that's why for me it was very liberating to find to find this new voice in in these abstract sculptures that I'm painting that are still, but I'm still embedding the story in them and I can still tell you the story, but it cannot be like, like that mural I did at the American consulate. If that was a figurative mural about indigenous women's resistance through uh, colonization and modernity, it would have never gone up on that wall yet. I was able to paint it and still honor this woman and still honor this tra tradition and still give it that force and that connection. And so that's how I've been able to survive it because my spirit and what I care about has always been, you know, these stories, these of, of struggle and resilience and of the past. And that's who I am, you know, I've been an activist for so long but how can you make your work still have that spirit without it being shot down? For me, personally, it was finding this way intuitively. I think everybody has to find their own way uh, in, in how they get to that point. But there was a lot of that like nitpicking when it was figurative and it, when it was symbols that people could see right away. So, you know, that I think that's, that answers that, yeah. <sighs> and what was the other question? Oh, it's a kind of a cool question. Um, do you think that the Mayan ruins in Mexico should be repainted to their original glory and effort to reclaim indigenous culture? In your experience, should you be, uh, should we be creating new art to bring people together or restoring the old? Mm. Well, you know, I think I think it's like I I go visit these um, these ruins that are here near where I am in Cuernavaca in Morelos, um, Xochicalco, and they have this beautiful. I'm going to be working on that for my show at Mad Art in September, so I go and visit those, and you can still see some of the ancient pigment in some of it. It's it's gorgeous, but. Um, and they have reproductions where you see, you can see like what kind of color they thought they had. I personally with these ruins, I think it's best to leave them as much as what they are now, because then we're connecting to what's there and what has happened. And it's good to imagine what it was somewhere else, but like the actual, um, you know, the actual sculptures and the actual uh, ruins, it's good to leave them as they were made, like what happened to them and then, but then reimagine your own work based on both of those things, you know, because um, I mean, yeah, like they're not rebuilding all of it. In some places they are, but there's something that feels a little fake about it when they like totally make like a Disney like pyramid, you know, so it's good to feel the all, feel the hands of the artisans that made it, 
and then imagine both the past of it and then the future of your own work. Um, but I think it's interesting to revisit it. And also, like, there's this minimalist, um, you know, crowd that loves, like, the white Greek sculptures and the stone uh, pyramids. But it's good to remind them too, like, cause now everybody's like, whoa, you're doing like sculpture and painting. Not now, like now I feel like a lot more people are doing that, but maybe 10 years ago when I started at Hunter, it was like, are you a painter? Are you a sculptor? Like, it's kind of weird. Like, but if you think about it, all of these people, like all the Greek sculptures were painted, all these, uh, pyramids were painted, all these sculptures made by the indigenous, by the Aztecs and the Mayans were painted. So painting and sculpture has been there forever, you know? And it's just people don't remember because the color has faded. And so now you have these beautiful white structures, which I find beautiful too. My sculpture, I love them white, but there's also this history about how they were painted and color and sculpture had been, you know, uh, used together for many, many years. Thank you. Yeah. Real quick how they're made. So, so each sculpture for the SeaTac airport is made out of 10 different segments that fit together on this beam that will be on top of the baggage carousels. And this is kind of like the column, the vertebrae, you know, of the sculpture. And, and I make the, I, you know, put my shape of the screen on top of the structures. Looks like this. And then we start giving it codes of, um, you know, plaster and JC and all kinds of things to make it hard. And that's like the most, the longest part of the process is building them because this is the first with one coat of paint, the first coat, the first culture we made. This is a studio we had in Seattle for about two years in Georgetown. And this is, um, my team the first week a lot of wonderful artists from seattle and um, here you can see the segments on their own and one of the things that i'm so glad that it's still in my process is uh, when i painted murals i love working in a team there's nothing better than like going through this month of strenuous work and community with the people around the area and then your own team and you get tired and you get grumpy and then you're happy and then it's like a beautiful thing to go through and i'm so glad that's still present in my work that i get to work with uh, with teams my team in seattle was longer than any other team because it was a project that lasted 20 months and so we had um between a group of between five eight mostly eight to like 13 people at a time working on this project um and you know it's it's the work that i make a lot of the work i make you could not i could not do it alone it would take me 20 years to make this by myself like it needs a team and it needs people that are committing to the work that are giving him their time their their talent their love you know there's so much time put into these works uh so I hope, I hope that you can feel it when you see them because nothing repeats in the sculptures, not the sculpture, not the painting. And, and you can, I can assure you that there were many people that were like, that spent many days on each part of that sculpture. You know? So one thing that I didn't mention is that I decided to connect the palette of each work with um, nature around bodies of water in Seattle. So we organized, I organized walks around these bodies of water in Seattle with my team um, to go and look for the palette for the work. So we took photographs and, and so a lot of the colors that, that you see that I'm using are coming from what I was seeing around me in Seattle. And <clears throat> that was part of what I wanted to do. Um, like when, when someone asks you to do a site specific work, like it would be really weird for me to come up with all of it here in Cuernavaca or in Brooklyn and then come and install these like ginormous sculptures for the Seattle people, you know, like for me, like when you do these projects, you kind of have to do the walk and you have to meet the people and you have to meet the land and you have to earn that respect, like the, earn that, that gift, you know, or that uh, honor. And, uh, 
I mean, you never quite, I mean, I, I don't know if I do, but I try. And we got the palette from, from this beautiful landscape. And I'm so glad that I got to know more of the area. These, these colors here is like, we were um, at Ruby Beach and we got there on a rainy day and we were collecting these things from, from the ground. And, you know, this wood, when it's wet, it has this orange and this red and this grays. You'll see them, once you see the sculptures, like these colors are in many different places. They became sort of a... Um, we also went to the San Juan Islands and to look at nature and a lot of the colors um, from one of the sculptures come from there and the sunset. So here are some of the painted, this is the white pieces. And <clears throat> I think all of them are very much related to nature and inspired by nature. You can see the forms are very organic. And then the painting comes in and does its own thing on the surface, you know, uh, maybe adding here the moss in Seattle around there. It's gorgeous colors. Um, so this is like half of one sculpture on one side. This was the sunset in San Juan Islands. Ah, you know, I love remembering all these moments when I look at these pieces again now with a little bit of space that I've been here. It's like, it, it brings me a lot of really nice memories. The blue, the ocean. These are some other works, but here you can see the rendering of the first piece put together into the space, more or less how they're, so this is all the real work finished and then put into the rendering, like how people are gonna be looking at it at the SeaTac Airport. And this is the team the, at the last, at the end, one of the last parties we had at the studio. We try to have one party every time that we finished each sculpture, so we had five. And this is the airport, and this is the beams where they're gonna be hung. So the pieces are gonna go on top of that. And that's me. I kind of look small in comparison to that, uh, <clears throat> the beam. But right now the, the baggage claims are all up, except for two, I think. And we're supposed, to, and all the works are finished. There's 50 crates in um, storage and we're about to put them all together in July. And hopefully, you know, we'll have an opening. Initially, we were gonna have a big party there and there was gonna be music and who knows what will happen now with everything that is going on. But I know that we'll make sure that people can see it somehow. Um, yeah. And right now I'm working on going back to Seattle at the end of the month to start installing this and I'll be uh, working on a show at Mad Art. So I'll be, you know, hopefully starting to get into Mad Art by mid-September and, um, and do a whole new project that I'm very excited about there. So, yeah. Yes, thank you. There's so many um, in the chat. There's so many just um, applause. There's so much applause. So um, I hope that you're able to kind of look at the chat. I can read a couple of them, but um, Let yeah. me, uh, maybe if I stop the share, then I can see. Yeah, you have to go down to the bottom and do that. And also, chat. I can see the chat now. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just a lot of. Um, applause for like we're so fortunate and honored to have your work in our city there are a bunch of questions here um that i that i skipped over a little bit but um if you want to answer any of them um like at what age did you know you were going to be an artist um that's an interesting one so i think i always did my mom was an anthropologist and she was in charge of, she was a physical anthropologist and she drew all the skeletons that she discovered in the ruins in Mexico. And, and when she was 40, she decided to go back to art school. And so she would bring me to, with her, she was kind of a single mom and she would bring me to classes. And so I would sit in the art classes and, and that was part of me. And like, I always loved it, but in a, in a kind of also in an instinctive way, because I remember like our neighbor came to the house and I would be like, I was like five and I would be like, 
please come to my studio and I would bring them to my room, you know, to see like a mask I made in kindergarten or, you know, like, and um, so it was like, it was always this thing. And I think when I was in high school that we had, we went to an economic depression in Mexico city and we had the indigenous rebellion. And, and I was like, mom, I will never be able to be an artist. I'm going to have to be an, a lawyer or international, like, what am I going to do so that we can survive, you know? And she was like, no way, like you're an artist, we're gonna figure it out. And so, you know, I applied to schools and I got this amazing uh, scholarship to go to Kenyon College, which is an incredible school. But, but she was always very supportive about that. And I think that was my nature and I was lucky enough to have a parent that like, I think my mom would have loved to be an artist too. And so she kind of allowed for that to, to happen in my life. Fabulous. There's um, a, sort of a couple people asking the same question, which is sort of, it's, it's two sides of one thing. Uh, what is the best piece of advice you've been given? And also what advice would you give people who are um, sort of starting their, their life as an artist? Yeah. Well, one of the most important things, um, if there's one thing here is I think trusting intuition is super important. Uh, there's many times as an artist where you're led one way or the other and once you start selling work you're being pulled in directions and and I think intuition if you can ever always come back to it like let that speak and lead you because it will lead you to the right place where all the things that you need will happen but if you try to get away from your nature and from who you really are then then you'll be like standing on nothing you know like I feel like an intuition takes your work into more interesting places it's always like try to have your work take you to a place where you've never been before let it surprise you let it teach you let it lead you because my 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 uh logical part of my brain is not the most in, you know like you let that other part lead that's one and as an artist I feel like you know, when I graduated from college uh, with my major and I moved to Washington, D.C., someone asked me like, oh, what's your name, Morella? And what do you do? I'm a muralist. Oh, you are? Yes. And that led me to paint my first mural in D.C. I, I had not really done much. I was in college. But I feel like you knowing what you are and what you're like, don't undermine yourself before there's an opportunity and always take the opportunity and do it you know like like that big piece that i have never done something three-dimensional like that big like you figure it out and 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 if you are you know following that part of yourself then that like like that like i did that 10 years ago and now i'm doing this for the um SeaTac airport and the pieces are really beautifully finished and you know like because the piece that i did 10 years ago i had to rip out of the wall and like and it crumbled and we threw it out and like now we're making these permanent works that are so pristine you know but but always go for it and never undermine yourself and always trust your intuition and you know keep your practice going you know i also tell my students like i've had big teams and you know my studio sometimes I, i'm hiring 10 people 13 people and uh because i get these projects and these budgets and but I always kept, I always worked for another artist, like for like 10 years, you know, like even if I had five people working at my studio for me, I was still working, doing something else. And everything that I got, I was, it went to my artwork and I survived from all these other things. So also don't feel bad about having other jobs always. It's always great not to depend on your artwork for your living because you never know what's going to happen and you don't want to depend on a sale and you don't want to feel like your work, your life depends on selling or like, it's always good to keep that other thing going and uh, as much as you can. And then your work will start taking more and more time, but, but don't feel, you know, like you have to not be doing all, all kinds of other things, whatever it is, you know, editing or I don't know. But, um, but I think, um, I think it's important to keep your practice as fresh and as, you know, not put too much pressure on it. Just the, the passion pressure, but not, not the art world pressure as much as possible. 
and support each other, support your friends and as much as you can, you know, like someone said, like, if you see that all your friends are doing great, that's great because then that's great for you too, because you are in the midst of people who are being very successful. And so you are also, you know, like share that with friends, try to not get jealous of each other and support each other and learn from each other and talk to each other because you know, we're always, as artists, we're very sensitive and we're very, like, we are emotional and empathetic, or at least I am, but, you know, but, but I think uh, it's really important to, like, feel solidarity and learn from each other and learn how to, like, you know, we are part of an environment, we're all connected and our work is very connected. And so when one of us is doing something, the other one will, you know, the rest will do well, too. Thank you so much. There, there's so many good questions here, which we just didn't get to. But the before we leave, I do want to get to sort of putting all of our faces up here so that you know that you were not talking into the void. As a teacher, I know that every once in a while I'm like, who, who's out there? <laughs> so if we could actually put on our uh, videos, that would be amazing. Yes, please. Hola, Marcel, Marela. Hola. ¿Cómo estás? ¿Estás en la Ciudad de México? Sí. sí, bueno, ahorita estoy afuera, estoy en Cuernavaca. Oh, sí, oh. Sí, Mucho gusto, me encanta todo tu trabajo. Gracias yeah. por compartir. Yeah. Cuando vaya, when I go back to Seattle, I love to, you know, be in touch with everybody as much as we can. Sí, oh, me gusta yeah. nada. I want to take screenshot. Hold on. This is one. Okay. How do I do, ah, uh, here, everybody. Gallery. But let me do this one. I, I, so I want to take a picture of everybody. Oh, it's gonna. We're gonna have to do it in two groups because there's. Okay. <laughs> so I'm, and then I, I go the other way. That this way. Yay! You know, guys, I've been. Um, it's been isolating. You know, like everybody. And as Amanda said, I. I love uh, dance parties. And so we've been organizing a dance party like this, where there's like 75 people on the screen. This is, it's the beauty of technology again, that we can, con oh my God. Thank right. you all for being here. This is incredible. Thank you so much. It feels really good to see all of your faces. Really hey, thank you for giving us a little bit of hope in this time. Um, and and the, the, the call to work together is just so beautiful. So thank you. Um, it is really important to us. And, 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 you know, let me just say Seattle has that and the art community in Seattle really has that. I feel like there's, you know, there's a lot of community involvement in terms of uh, artists helping other artists. And, um, it's been beautiful to be part of that while I've been there. And I know that I will always be connected to Seattle now forever, you know, like it, it became part of my life. I had to move there for two years and I moved my son and my husband there for, for this time. And, and I will be forever kind of like part of Seattle, you know, so thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank Gracias. You. Thank you. Stop the recording. <laughs> thank you.